Hey guys, welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Welcome back to another weekly used gun review. In these videos, we take six used firearms that have come into our store, either through the front door or through our website, and give you guys about a five to six minute review of each, so you have an idea of some different cool stuff out there on the market. If you guys come back to these videos regularly and enjoy them, please let me know by hitting that subscribe button. I would really appreciate it. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump into it now. All right, this video is brought to you by our website, WeBuyGuns.com. If you are considering selling a firearm or firearms collection, please log on to our website and create an account. From there, you can submit your firearms for an offer request, and with that offer request, you will get a printable offer certificate, which you can take with you to competing gun stores in your area to try and leverage yourself a better deal. If you are unable to get a better deal, go ahead and sell them to us. We do provide you with a shipping label, and we will pay you with either a paper check or ACH direct deposit, your choice of whichever is more convenient convenient to you and through our website is how we source most of the firearms you guys see in these videos. So again, please go check us out at webuyguns.com. Now remember the format of this video is we start with most common and move through least common as a video progresses, starting us off with our first spot. Everybody is going to recognize right away that I have a pair of M1 Garand rifles here. Now, um, I have talked about the M1 rifle many times on these videos before, but this is a really nice set, which I'll talk about specifically the details of both of these here in a minute. Uh, so I did not want to waste the opportunity to put them in front of the camera. The M1 Garand was the brainchild of Canadian arms designer John C. Garand. Of course, Garand is how you're supposed to pronounce it. I, like everybody else, say Garand, so I'll say Garand for the rest of this video. <laughs> but John C. Garand, uh, born in Canada, had located to the United States and became a U.S. citizen, had worked with Springfield Arsenal. Now, that is not to be confused with the Springfield that exists today in Illinois. This was back when it was a government, or it was a separate entity, but this is a government-owned uh, armory who would manufacture things like the 1903s and the M1 Garands, actually all the way up until the M16. They would be active producing firearms for the United States military. Now, in the interwar period between World War I and World War II, the United States, like a lot of other countries, wanted to move into a semi-automatic standard-issue rifle. Now, there were some requirements put out in this regard in the early 1920s, which John C. Garand had uh, caught on to and started designing this sort of contraption you see here, the early vari variations of it, which was originally chambered in a 7mm type cartridge. I'll put the exact uh, uh, specifications down below. It was a 2, two something. I can't remember. I'll, I'll put it down below. Um, had a different injection system, had a different gas system. But through the 1920s, he would sort of revise and go over this design. And then finally, through the 30s, it would be adopted by the United States military in 1936. Now, early variations would be known as the gas trap grand, where you had a little gas trap device right up here at the front of the muzzle, which would trap gases, as the name would suggest, reverting them back through the gas tube and running the long stroke gas piston. Now, later on, they would go to a traditional gas block as the gas trap was found to not be uh, not to be reliable in places like cold conditions and things like that. So this is going to be a much more reliable design. Now, these would most notably see service in the Second World War, of which Springfield and Winchester would manufacture all of the M1s used in World War II. Between the two, they would manufacture about 4 million copies of these. This was an innovative design and would even be coined as the greatest battle implement ever devised by General, uh, by a General Patton. So what you have here essentially is a semi-automatic rifle that feeds from an internal uh, feeds from an internal magazine fed by an eight-round in-block clip. Everybody knows the iconic ping sound when the eighth round is expended, the clip flings out of the top. This was the first real modern military to field a semi-automatic rifle issued to everybody. Of course, there were other uh, forces like the Germans and the Russians that had semi-automatic rifle technology, but they did not have production scaled up enough to to issue them out to every single uh, rifleman in their militaries. They were still uh, mainly reliant on things like the Mosin Nagants and K98s, but in the United States, uh, by, you know, about, you know, past the early years of the uh, P Pacific Campaign, these were pretty much issued out to everybody, uh, both in the Marines and the Army, or the Pacific Theater or the uh, European Theater. Um, Really cool rifles. They would then go on to sea service in Korea, later in Vietnam. These would officially be phased out of U.S. service in 1957 when replaced by the M14, uh, although these would still see uh, uh, a pretty significant amount of use all the way up through about the mid-1960s. 
these would be manufactured, as I mentioned, by Springfield and Winchester during World War II, and then during the Korea War era, uh, they would be manufactured by Springfield as well, and then uh, joined in production by H&R and International Harvester. So. Very cool rifles. Uh, what I specifically have here, this top one is a Springfield, this bottom one is a Winchester. Both were manufactured in 1944. Both of us came, uh, both of these came to us from a local customer. So thank you so much for selling these to us. Interesting things about this is this Springfield actually has a lot of the early features. It has log bar rear sights. These were largely replaced after the Second World War. Uh, it has mostly Springfield parts. Actually, I think everything in here is Springfield, but it does have a late stamped trigger guard barrel is matched to the receiver at least by production date and it still has its SAGAW uh, with ordnance wheel acceptance mark on the left hand side meaning that this is an original and not replacement stocks. So this has a lot of early features making this one pretty cool. This one is a Winchester also matched to the receiver by the barrel uh, by about you know the production time if you will. Uh, although actually I don't believe Winchester uh, date coded these barrels, but they were all made during the Second World War, so it would have been close in there in production anyway. Uh, it does have a mix of some Springfield parts and again a late trigger guard, and this is a replacement stock. So a lot of mixed master parts here, but does have an original barrel to action. So anyway, really cool rifles on the market today. M1s go all over the place depending on who made them, um, if the parts are correct. If you have a World War II era that is correct, so like an all correct World War II era Winchester. Um, these things can go north of $3,000, okay? If you have your traditional mixed matched parts and stuff like that, you know, somewhere in the low teens, um, at least for a Winchester. And then, you know, this one here, Springfield again has, um, you know, all correct uh, parts, at least except for the trigger guard, original World War II stock and sights with 1944 dated barrel and the serial puts it at about that time frame too. So this is pretty much all World War II components. Um, again, I would probably say mid-teens, uh, if you will. So anyway, uh, if you just get like, you know, post-war, uh, all reefer replacement stocks in okay condition, you know, those can be at around a thousand or a little bit less. You can always go to the CMP and grade your M1 rifle and see the options based on how correct you want it to be or the manufacturer and things like that. You'll see that the price is definitely vary. So you can get a decent, okay condition, non-collectible shooter for probably as cheap as eight or nine hundred dollars right now. It'd probably be the lowest. But anyway, really cool rifle. Is happy to get these in and share them with you. Okay, up next is a very interesting rifle. This one comes to us from a customer in Pennsylvania. So thank you so much for selling this one to us. This is a Desert Tech MDRX. This one is a 308 with a 16 inch barrel. Now this is an interesting rifle with kind of a troubled history when it comes to Desert Tech getting this thing off the ground. Now this was first introduced at SHOT Show in 2014 and it was met with a lot of interest. I mean a lot of people were incredibly excited about this firearm. It offered a true barrel conversion modularity. You can use this and adapt this to different types of roles uh, due to its barrel lengths offered in 16 and 20 inch configurations as well as its bullpup configuration making it very short, very easy to handle, very lightweight, and very well balanced. And because of the quick barrel change, you could switch the barrel, the bolt, the magazine. You could go from 308 to 556 to 300 blackout to 6.5 Creedmoor. You could change your barrel lengths. I mean, it was a really cool design. Again, if we're talking about going back to 2014. Now, they would have a lot of people very interesting and interested in putting in pre-orders and getting this rifle. Uh, Desert Tech had promised to release it one year later in 2015. However, they had a lot of issues with development and getting this thing off the ground, and it did not finally hit shelves until 2017. I remember because I was one of those people very excited about this rifle. There was a lot of fatigue about it already, people having waited uh, three years for this to finally hit the shelf. So by then, a lot of people had started to really kind of lose interest. And then finally, uh, it was like January or February of 2017, they announced that it would be releasing in July of that year. So about six months earlier, some people, of course, were afraid that the, de the uh, launch date would be pushed back again, but it did finally launch in 2017. And that was known as the MDR, not the MDRX, and that stands for Micro Dynamic Rifle. Now, very quickly, it made its way out into the public, especially with people, writers, and video man uh, video makers, you know, YouTubers and stuff like that. And while some people had success, there was one notable video actually done on in range with Carl and Ian from Forgotten Weapons, and they had been testing one of these, and they had nothing but issues with it, which they attributed mainly to the gas system. 
they tried different ammunition types they could not seem to get the thing to run and it was a 45 minute long video it's funny because i commented on that video when it first came out and my comment at least from my view is somewhere near the top so i'll put a screenshot of that i still think that's funny um what had actually happened was a really good outcome from desert tech the owner or operator of the company actually put out a video of their own acknowledging the issues not making excuses and then going through a procedure that they're going to do to modify the rifle to make it you know what it should be it should be totally uh, i mean this is this is going to be you know the united states next rifle that's what they wanted it to be it, it was inexcusable for it to have so many issues so he made a series of videos sort of walking through the changes that they were making. They made several changes, especially around the components that were used to manufacture the exterior of the rifle. Also with the, uh, the uh, muzzle device and most importantly, the gas system. The gas system actually went through two revisions and later they would then launch the X, X being extreme. Uh, and that is what the MDR X is. So some people say, oh, the MDR X or the MDR is a horrible rifle, blah, blah, blah. It was the MDR X where they got all those bugs worked out. Since then, Ian and Carl have reviewed the rifles and they, you know, it passed their mud tests and everything like that. So, I mean, it actually, the MDR X now is a good rifle. But finally, they would release this in 2020. And it, so, you know, we go from beginning of inception in 2014 to the final acceptable product in 2020. So that was kind of its issue. For what it is though, if you like bullpup rifles, these are really, really cool. They are fully modular. The parts and things like that are available. You can purchase them in those calibers. You can do whatever swapping around you want to do. It's not like the uh, Bushmaster ACR where barrel conversions were promised but never came. So this is really a fully supported rifle and a really good product. So on the used market today, you should be able to find something like this in the 308 conversion and the high teens, low twos, uh, depending on condition and what it comes with. But anyway, very cool rifle. That is the Desert Tech MDR-X. Okay, up next we have a firearm that comes to us from a viewer in Arizona. So thank you so much for selling this one to us. This is an FNFAL chambered in 308 or 762 NATO. Now, this was originally designed by Diodene Save in Belgium, and since the 1950s, when it would really enter mass production, has become one of the most iconic and most widely militarily used rifles that there has ever been, probably up there alongside with the AK. Now, if we go back to World War II, a lot of countries are learning a lot of lessons. We talked about the M1 Garand and how different countries are talking about moving into or wanting to move into semi-automatic rifles issued to everybody. Russia had their SVT-38 uh, and later SVT-40 semi-automatic weapons program, and Germany had the same with the G-41 and later the K and G-43 rifles. But they didn't have production up enough, and most countries were still issuing bolt-action rifles to most of their you know, rifle infantry uh, uh, personnel. Now, there were other firearms that were coming onto the scene as well. One notable out of Germany was the Sturmgewehr, the STG-44, the MP-43, MP-44, which was chambered in 7.92 by 33 Kurtz. Now, it was a select fire intermediate cartridge rifle, and Germany had hopes of actually issuing those out to everybody, which would have been the first real country to have the so-called assault rifle issued to everybody, um, like we do today with AKs and M16s and things like that. Now, post-war... A lot of countries start getting to work coming up with what is going to be the new generation of rifles. Obviously, bolt action is gone out the window. We're going to go to either a select fire or at least a semi-automatic rifle in either an intermediate cartridge or a full-powered rifle cartridge. Now, a lot of the NATO countries around the time, the 1950s, most notably with the United States and Great Britain, are trying to standardize on a caliber. The 30 caliber light rifle cartridge would be one that they would uh, land on, and it was actually the FAL that was at sort of the center of that debate. Now, just after World War II in 1946, Diodene Save of FN in Belgium would start working on this. Now, originally, this would be offered in the 7.92 by 33 Kurt, so you see where the influences are coming from. Now, Great Britain had noticed what work was being done on this rifle, and they quickly wanted a variation of this in their own cartridge, the 280 British, but they wanted it in a bullpup configuration. Of course, we know that uh, the British were looking at one of their own domestic designs, the EM2, which was a bullpup in 280, so they wanted a prototype version of this to compare with their own uh, rifle production. By 1950, they had the prototypes. FN did not really have an interest in keeping in the bullpup configuration, and they really had no interest in staying in the 280 cartridge. At the same time, 1950 to 1951, Great Britain had gone to the United States and tried to urge them to also look at adopting the FAL so they could have a standard rifle and a standard uh, cartridge, so the sort of rifle and ammunition commonality between the different nations. Well, 
the United States was sort of pursuing their own weapons program. At the heart of it was a modified version of the M1 Grand, which would later be adopted as the M14, but they were still open to the idea of accepting the FAL. In fact, Belgium, uh, FN in Belgium had created a 30, basically the, the, the rifle and the 30 caliber light rifle cartridge later, the 308 or 762 NATO had provided it to the United States for testing and had even said that if they adopted the FAL, they could produce it royalty free. They really wanted the U.S. to get into this rifle, thinking that Great Britain would also adopt it as well, as well as other uh, related allied countries. Well, uh, Great Britain would change and go towards the direction of the EM-2 and officially adopt that. The United States would go the direction of the M-14 and officially adopt that. However, due to the loss of the Labor Party and a election coming up after that time, uh, Great Britain would actually change course from the EM-2 and go back to the FAO, which they would adopt in the so-called inch pattern. Then with sort of the sort of interest in uh, and the adoption of this as a military implement, the final sort of design iterations of the FAO would be officially released in 1951, and then they would start going in full-scale production in 1953. Since then, you have New Zealand, Australia, Ireland, Great Britain, I mean, all the South American countries, all the African countries, uh, Israel, um, many, 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 some, some upwards of 80 or 90 different countries would adopt some variation of the FAL rifle. So it became incredibly popular, again, dubbed the right arm of the free world. Now today on the market, you have a lot of civilian semi-automatic versions of the FAL. And there were actually official uh, military versions. Uh, for example, the British pattern was a semi-automatic only and the Falkland Island campaign uh, British soldiers would actually drop these and pick up uh, the fully automatic uh, variants that I believe the Venezuelans were using against them. Argentinians, Argentinians, excuse me. So today in the U.S. market, you have semi-automatic versions. This most prominent is made by DSA or DS Arms, where they are all they make them in all the different configurations, um, and you can get them in different barrel lengths. This one's a 16-inch configuration, um, brand new. Uh, this uh, use, you typically find them in the 1000 to $1,400 range or so, depending on condition and what it comes with and all that type of stuff. Uh, you can also find these built as parts kits. As many different countries had used these, you could buy parts kits from those different countries, or West Germany, the, the G1, for example. Uh, and people have built those on different receivers. And so you can find those on the market, too, if you want them built on original surplus parts. Uh, there's also some pre-ban FALs, those coming from FN, also those coming from Israel, um, that are actually built in foreign countries and imported into to the United States. So there's many different variations of FAL from many different countries you can get. Uh, and they definitely range in price. You know, some very rare collectibles can get up there in price. You know, things like this can be kind of towards the lower end. But anyway, that's the basic uh, rundown of the FAL. Very, very cool rifles. Always happy to see one come in. Okay, up next is a gorgeous rifle that comes to us from a customer in Michigan. So thank you so much for selling this one to us. This is a Spencer Carbine. Specifically, this is a very faithful and very nice recreation or replica of an original Spencer Carbine. This one being manufactured by Army Sport in Italy and imported by Cimarron Firearms. This one is chambered in 45 Colt. However, the originals were not chambered in 45 Colt. They were chambered in 5656 Spencer, which you're not going to be able to find that ammunition today. So they made them in a more practical cow. This original design was brought about by Christopher Spencer and was first released in the year 1860. Now remember, that was also the year the very first repeating lever gun from Henry was released, the Model 1860, which we've talked about before, and I'll talk about that here in a minute, how that affected these. Now Christopher Spencer, like a lot of other arms designers, was trying to revolutionize the way military arms and military implements were designed and how the how it sort of the thought process was approached and how much ammunition should be able to be expended by a fighting force. The idea being if your fighting force stopped to reload less often, they could put more rounds downrange, which would equate to higher enemy casualty rates. Now he would come up with this idea. It was the very first ever adopted repeating rifle, lever action rifle, if you will. You had a magazine tube here located in the buttstock. You would pull this follower rod out, load your ammunition in, replace the spring loaded follower like this, lock it down. And then you had a lever here under the trigger, or I guess it serves as a trigger guard. You pull this down. You do have a falling breech block action. A round would then be fed in through the magazine tube, fed into the chamber. I'm sorry, you'd go to half cock before you did that. Go to full cock to fire. 
Once you fire, you go to half cock again, you throw the action, the spent round will be pulled out on top of sort of a elevator fork on top of the action, kind of hard to show you guys. A new round would come in and as this lifted up, it would bring your spent casing to the top of the action where gravity would just allow it to fall off the top. You did have a little bit more complexity here having to go to half cock and full cock between each shot and it was very possible that uh, rounds both spent casing and live rounds which are both simultaneously entering the action at the same time could bind up and create stoppages. It was a very crude rudimentary approach but it was miles ahead of the muzzle loaded technology that was around at the day. Christopher Spencer would submit it to the United States War Department for evaluation and they were not so interested in moving forward with this technology. They were already having a lot of issues supplying ammunition to the troops especially during these Civil War years. Um, and if we're talking about in, you know, uh, introducing an implement that could increase the rate of fire by a factor of seven, that is seven times the amount of ammunition you're going to need, which to them was going to be a logistical nightmare. So they opted to stay away from this as standard issue. However, they would adopt this first with the Navy and then with the Army for cavalry purposes on horseback. It's a lot easier to use something like this than it is a muzzle-loaded carbine rifle or a pistol where you have to stop you know, and reload the rifle or pistol while you're bouncing around on horseback. Better to have something already loaded that you can go through a much quicker loading process between shots. So this would be adopted for that purpose. It would see limited success in the commercial market as well. However, as I mentioned, Henry had already released their very first rifle in 1860. By 1866, Winchester is involved and they have the updated model 1866 with the King patent loading gate, making loading the rifle even easier than this or the 1860 Henry. So Winchester is really starting to steal the market in this type of regard. This technology is just not good enough compared to the Winchester rifles that are coming out. So by 1869, actually the Spencer Repeating Arms Company would be sold to Winchester they would face this out of production in favor of their more successful Winchester lines already being produced, go on in the rest of the history with what we now know as lever action repeating rifles. Today on the market, of course, we have replicas like this, which are really nice and fun to shoot and more modern and more available calibers. If you're looking at an original 1860 Spencer on the market today, if it's in like museum grade quality, they could be worth several thousands of dollars, lots of collectors out there for them. I've seen very rough condition shooter grade ones. And again, that's 56, 56 Spencer, which is gonna be hard to find. Uh, don't go for that much money, uh, maybe a little under a thousand, a little over a thousand for a rough condition one. Something like this, really beautiful imported rifle uh, in used condition uh, anywhere from about, you know, the mid to the high teens is about right and where you find these today. So anyway, really cool rifle, really happy to get this one in and share it with you guys. Okay, up next we have a very interesting rifle coming to us from a customer in Minnesota. So thank you so much for selling this one to us. This is a Ruger M44 or Model 44 carbine chambered in 44 Magnum. I just recently had this in an unboxing video, so you guys probably might recognize it from there. Now the story with this would begin in about 1959 when Ruger would be interested in coming up with a new sort of take on the deer hunting rifle or deer hunting experience. They wanted something that was going to be lightweight and very compact for the on the move type hunter who might be operating in very tight brush or foliage or anything like that. So it was going to be a nice brush gun. Very easy to maneuver, very lightweight to carry. So by 1961, they had uh, come out with this concept and they would release it as the Deer Stalker. Now, unfortunately, there's another company called Ithaca that has a line of hunting firearms called the Deer Slayer. Uh, the Ithaca company thought that Deer Stalker was too close of a brand name and could ca cause confusion with consumers in the marketplace, therefore threatened Ruger with a lawsuit if they did not change the name of the rifle, and Ruger capitulated and did so. So in about 1963, they changed the name of this to simply the Model 44 rifle, model, just the Model 44. This was stay in production until 1985 when it would go out of production due to the cost of production, which just became too expensive to produce. One of the reasons for that is very interesting enough that by the 1960s, Ruger was very well known for their use of investment casting on their parts, especially receivers. On this rifle, however, they wanted to go to a full block of steel that would be machined down to form the closed top receiver action of this rifle. They believed that they would need that extra rigidity and strength because of the 44 Magnum cartridge. This fed from an internal tube magazine holding four rounds and uh, it was for all intents and purposes a very popular rifle at the time but again by the 1980s too expensive to produce. 
One of the best benefits about this rifle though is it would become the later springboard for the rifle for the 1022 rifle released by Ruger in 1964. Now that has been offered in a few different calibers but the most popular and the most collected or purchased today would be in the 22 long rifle. Very much like this rifle however it does use a detachable 10 round rotary magazine now they make the 25 round stick mags and that has sort of become the legacy of this rifle. Also in the year 2000, Ruger released another rifle called the Deerfield. It was only produced for about six years. It was based on an open top receiver and had more in common with the Mini 14 than it does with this rifle. But anyway, uh, about 250,000 of these were manufactured, so they are not too, uh, not too many were produced in comparison to the other offerings from Ruger, but still a very cool rifle, and at first glance, it definitely looks like a 1022 to most people. Um, on the market today, these do have a pretty uh, widespread on their pricing, but you typically find them hovering around the $1,000 range, plus or minus, depending on what they come with and condition. So, and again, the very early marked deer stock or carbines are going to be by far the most valuable, uh, assuming they're in good condition. So anyway, very cool rifle. Happy to get this in and share it with you guys. Okay, last but not least, we have a very cool rifle that comes to us from a customer in Oregon. So thank you so much for selling this one to us. This is an Israeli Galil model 329 specifically i'll talk about what those numbers mean but what this is is the ar configuration in the 308 which uses a 25 round detachable box magazine let me pull this out of here real quick for you guys so i have talked about the galil in many instances in these videos before typically when i've had things like the galani or the ati galeo uh, rifles, so the history is going to be the same, but I'll talk a little bit about the early import history of this as well. Quickly to recap, um, Israel becomes an independent state in 1948 following the Second World War. Since then, they've always used sort of a hodgepodge culmination of different firearms, including those captured from uh, Germany after the Second World War, some donated by the United States. But finally, they would start to settle into their own arms production through the 1960s and 1970s. Now, one of the first was an Uzi Gall variant, the Uzi submachine gun. And also one was adopted uh, by the IDF as the, uh, in 1955 as the FAL, uh, which would be their variant of that as well. Now, the FAL served as a good primary battle rifle. However, it was a little bit long and could uh, see malfunction and stoppages in the sandy, arid conditions that the IDF was usually operating in. So in some cases, a lot of IDF troops would even drop the FAL in favor of carrying around the Uzi submachine gun in the 9mm subcaliber cartridge. Now, this would come to a head in the Six-Day War in the late 1960s when actually they would start picking up the now-used Kalashnikov AKM patterns, the Mahdi produced variants of those, send them back to Israel, and they would begin to see test and evaluation. They were much favored over the FAL. For one, they were a lot lighter and easier to carry around, especially for long durations. Two, they were also way more reliable due to their uh, sort of looser tolerances as opposed to what you find in an FAL rifle. So the IDF uh, wanted to move into something that was going to be more reminiscent of the AKM pattern. So later in the early 1970s, Israel Galil would start working on production of what would later turn into this rifle, taking heavy influences off of the AKM. Now first he would start using the RK-62 receivers, which were Valmet rifles from Finland, which they themselves were a variant based off of the AKM pattern and start coming up with what later would be adopted as this, the Galil rifle. Now this would be adopted in the 1970s and would be used by the IDF all the way up to the 1990s when it would be replaced by the Tavor rifle series, which we've also talked about in these videos. But although this was a primary issue rifle, this would actually not see much, as much service, I should say, as the M16, which by about 1975 was being supplied by the United States as part of their aid program to Israel. So. They were cheaper, obviously, to get them from free or to even purchase M16s from the United States than it was to even produce these at home. So although these did see service, you would not have seen these as often as the M16 is if you were in the IDF during that period of time. Now, the configuration that was adopted by the, AT, uh, by the ATF, there you go, by the... Uh, by the IDF was the ARM. The ARM was notable as having a wooden handguard with a bipod and a bayonet lug and was chambered in the 556. 
Now, uh, Galil would actually work with IMI, Israeli Military Industries, with coming up with a 308 pattern. It was going to be used. Some African countries did adopt it in 308, but it was mainly going to be a commercial export, and that is essentially what this is. Now, in the mid to late 1980s, the Galil rifle would come in by, uh, manufactured by IMI and imported by Action Arms, Magnum Research, and later Springfield, in many different configurations. They would be brought in in both 308 and 556 and be brought in in different configurations. Now, the three configurations of the Galil are the ARM, which I already discussed, having the bipod, kind of like the light machine gun variant, if you will, bipod, bipod and heavier handguard. The AR, which is this, which is the carbine version without the bipod, would have had a bayonet lug and would have used this high impact polymer uh, handguard, kind of the quickest way you know you're looking at an AR configuration, but the standard rifle length barrel. And then the SAR, which was just like the AR like this, but just had a carbine length barrel. Okay, again, used by the IDF and 5.56. Variations of those, the AR and the SAR, would come into the country under many different model designations. This one just happening to be the 329, uh, and sold as you know just a, a commercial import for the civilian market. Now, in 1989, George Bush Sr. would enact an importation restriction on non-sporting firearms, of which these would not be able to be sold anymore. They would come out with the sporting configuration with the S uh, designation, which would. You have a transitional period with the large S and then later into the sporting uh, area with the thumbhole stocks and the lack of the threaded muzzle and the, actually these never had bayonet legs anyway. The 329 series did not buy action arms. You'd have the earlier Magnum Research, which you typically have more of the military features. Action arms would start bringing them in and then by the time Springfield was bringing them in, that was pretty much post-ban and most of those are all in post-ban configuration. If we're talking about the market today, of course, the Israeli ones and the, all of the different variants of Galils that have been manufactured, these are the ones that people want the most, therefore cost more. The sporter configuration that I had talked about, uh, the sporting configuration of these, typically is starting in about the low 2,000 range, depending on what they come with in condition. Uh, and then, you know, depending on variants such as the uh, the ARM with the wooden handguards and the bayonet lugs and the bipods and stuff, those are probably the most desirable and they're ticking up, you know, past maybe uh, well, well beyond that. So uh, upwards of 2000 plus. So anyway, very cool, very collectible rifles. Very happy to get this one in. And that is how we will end this video. Well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting the like button. Please also consider subscribing to my channel and hit that bell notification button so you know when we are posting new content. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave you off with that. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV, and I will see you next time.